पेज नंबर फोर्टी एट लेसन नंबर फोर फ्रॉम द डायरी ऑफ एन फ्रैंक दिस इज रिटन बाय एन फ्रैंक हर्सेल्फ दिस पेज आल्सो कंटेन्स अ फोटोग्राफ ऑफ एन फ्रैंक एंड इट इज डिस्क्राइब बाय एन फ्रैंक एज This is a photo I would wish myself to look all the time. Then I would maybe have a chance to come to Hollywood. Anne Frank, tenth October, nineteen forty-two. Now, before you read, Annalise Mary Anne Frank, who was born on twelfth of June. 1929 and lived till february or march 1945 was a german born jewish girl who wrote while in hiding with her family and four friends in amsterdam during the german occupation of the netherlands in world war the second her family had moved to amsterdam after the nazis gained power in germany but were trapped when the nazi occupation extended into the netherlands as persecutions against the jewish population increased the family went into hiding in july 1942 in hidden rooms in her father otto frank's office building after two years in hiding the group was betrayed and transported to the concentration camp system where ann died of typhus in bergen belsen within days of her sister margot frank her father otto the only survivor of the group returned to amsterdam after the war ended to find that her diary had been saved convinced that it was a unique record he took action to have it published in english under the name the diary of a young girl The diary was given to Anne Frank for her 13th birthday and chronicles the events of her life from 12th June 1942 until its final entry of 1st August 1944. It was eventually translated from its original Dutch into many languages and became one of the world's most widely read books. There have also been several films television and theatrical productions and even an opera based on the diary described as the work of a mature and insightful mind the diary provides an intimate examination of daily life under nazi occupation and frank has become one of the most renowned and discussed of the holocaust victims page 49 activity Number 1 Do you keep a diary Given here after under A are some terms we use to describe a written record of personal experience Can you match them with their descriptions under B You may look up the terms in a dictionary if you wish Now under the column A Number 1 journal Number 2 diary number 3 log number 4 memoirs now under b there are certain options which are to be matched with the corresponding words which describe them fully the first one is a book with a separate space or page for each day in which you write down your thoughts and feelings or what has happened on that day a full record of a journey a period of time or an event written every day a record of a person's own life and experiences usually a famous person a written record of events with times and dates usually official second here are some entries from personal records use the definitions given earlier to decide which of the entries 
might be from a diary, a journal, a log, or a memoir. Number one, I woke up very late today and promptly got a scolding from my mum. I can't help it. How can I miss the FIFA World Cup matches? Now there is a space for your answer. Number two, 10.30 a.m. Went to the office of the director. 1 p.m. Had lunch with the chairman. 5.45 p.m. Received Rahul at the airport. 9.30 p.m. Dinner at home. Here also there is a space for your answer. Number 3. The ride to Uti was uneventful. We rested for a while every 50 kilometers or so and used the time to capture the magnificent landscape with my handicam. From Uti, we went on to Bangalore. What a contrast. The noise and pollution of this once beautiful city really broke my heart. There is a space for your answer. Number four. This is how Raj Kapoor found me, all wet and ragged outside RK Studios. He was then looking for just someone like this for a small role in Mera Naam Joker, and he cast me on the spot. The rest, as they say, is history. There is a space for your answer. Page 50. Here the lesson starts. Writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me. Not only because I have never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13-year-old schoolgirl. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I feel like writing. And I have an even greater need to get all kinds of things off my chest. Paper has more patience than people. I thought of this saying on one of those days when I was feeling a little depressed and was sitting at home with my chin in my hands, bored and listless, wondering whether to stay in or go out. I finally stayed where I was, brooding. Yes, paper does have more patience. And since I am not planning to let anyone else read this stiff-backed notebook, grandly referred to as a diary, unless I should ever find a real friend, it probably won't make a bit of difference. Now I am back to the point that prompted me to keep a diary in the first place. I don't have a friend. Let me put it more clearly. Since no one will believe that a 13-year-old girl is completely alone in the world. And I am not. I have loving parents and a 16-year-old sister and there are about 30 people I can call friends. I have a family, loving aunts and a good home. No, on the surface, I seem to have everything, except my one true friend. All I think about when I am with friends is having a good time. I can't bring myself to talk about anything but ordinary everyday things. We don't seem to be able to get any closer, and that's the problem. Maybe it's my fault that we don't confide in each other. In any case, that's just how things are. And unfortunately, they are not able to change. This is why I have started the diary. To enhance the image of this long-awaited friend in my imagination, I don't want to jot down the facts in this diary the way most people would do. But I want the diary to be my friend. And I am going to call this friend Kitty. Page 51. Oral Comprehension Check. Number 1. What makes writing in a diary a strange experience for Anne Frank? Number 2. Why does Anne 
want to keep a diary? Number three, why did Anne think she could confide more in her diary than in people? Now the story runs further. Since no one would understand a word of my stories to Kitty, if I were to plunge right in, I would better provide a brief sketch of my life, much as I dislike doing so. My father, the most adorable father I have ever seen, didn't marry my mother until he was 36 and she was 25. My sister, Margot, was born in Frankfurt in Germany in 1926. I was born on 12th June 1929. I lived in Frankfurt until I was four. My father immigrated to Holland in 1933. My mother, Edith Hollander Frank, went with him to Holland in September, while Margot and I were sent to Aachen to stay with our grandmother. Margot went to Holland in December, and I followed in February, when I was plunked down on the table as a birthday present for Margot. I started right away at the Montessori Nursery School. I stayed there until I was six, at which time I started in the first form. In the sixth form, my teacher was Mrs. Cuperus, the headmistress. At the end of the year, we were both in tears as we said a heartbreaking farewell. In the summer of 1941, Grandma fell ill and had to have an operation. So my birthday passed with little celebration. Grandma died in January 1942. No one knows how often I think of her and still love her. This birthday celebration in 1942 was intended to make up for the other and Grandma's candle was lit along with the rest. The four of us are still doing well and that brings me to the present date of 20th June 1942 and the solemn dedication of my diary. Now, oral comprehension check. Number one, why does Anne provide a brief sketch of her life? Number two, what tells you that Anne loved her grandmother? Page 52 Dearest Kitty, our entire class is quaking in its boots. The reason, of course, is the forthcoming meeting in which the teachers decide who will move up to the next form and who will be kept back. Half the class is making bets. G.N., and I laugh ourselves silly at the two boys behind us, C.N. and Jack, who have staked their entire holiday savings on their bet. From morning to night, it's you who are going to pass. No, I am not. Yes, you are. No, I am not. Even G's pleading glances and my angry outbursts can't calm them down. If you ask me, there are so many dummies that about a quarter of the class if you ask me there are so many dummies that about a quarter of the class should be kept back but teachers are the most unpredictable creatures on earth i am not so worried about my girlfriends and myself we'll make it the only subject i am not sure about is maths anyway all we can do is wait until then, we keep telling each other not to lose heart. I get along pretty well with all my teachers. There are nine of them, seven men and two women. Mr. Keesing, the old fogey who teaches maths, was annoyed with me for ages because I talked so much. After several warnings, he assigned me extra homework, an essay on the subject, a chatterbox. A chatterbox. What can you write about that? I would worry about that later, I decided. I jotted down the title in my notebook, tucked it in my bag and tried to keep quiet. That evening, after I had finished the rest of my homework, 
The note about the essay caught my eye. I began thinking about the subject while chewing the tip of my fountain pen. Anyone could ramble on and leave big spaces between the words, but the trick was to come up with convincing arguments to prove the necessity of talking. I thought and thought, and suddenly I had an idea. I wrote the three pages Mr. Keesing had assigned me and was satisfied. I argued that talking is a student's trait and that I would do my best to keep it under control, but that I would never be able to cure myself of the habit since my mother talked as much as I did, if not more, and that there is not much you can do about inherited traits. Page number 53 Mr. Keesing had a good laugh at my arguments, but when I proceeded to talk my way through the next lesson, he assigned me a second essay. This time, it was supposed to be on an incorrigible chatterbox. I handed it in, and Mr. Keesing had nothing to complain about for two whole lessons. However, during the third lesson, he had finally had enough. And Frank, as punishment for talking in class, write an essay entitled Quack, 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 said Mistress Chatterbox. The class roared. I had to laugh too, though I had nearly exhausted my ingenuity on the topic of chatterboxes. It was time to come up with something else, something original. My friend San, who was good at poetry, offered to help me write the essay from beginning to end in verse, and I jumped for joy. Mr. Keesing was trying to play a joke on me with this ridiculous subject, but I would make sure the joke was on him. I finished my poem, and it was beautiful. It was about a mother duck and a father swan, with three baby ducklings who were bitten to death by the father because they cracked too much. Luckily, Mr. Keesing took the joke the right way. Page number 54 He read the poem to the class, adding his own comments, and to several other classes as well. Since then, I have been allowed to talk and haven't been assigned any extra homework. On the contrary, Mr. Keesing's always making jokes these days. Yours, Anne. This is extracted from the diary of a young girl with slight adaptation. Oral comprehension check. Number one. Why was Mr. Keesing annoyed with Anne? What did he ask her to do? Number two. How did Anne justify her being a chatterbox in her essay? Number three, do you think Mr. Keesing was a strict teacher? Number four, what made Mr. Keesing allow Anne to talk in class? Thinking about the text. Number one, was Anne right when she said that the world would not be interested in the musings of a 13-year-old girl? Number two, there are some examples of diary or journal entries in the before you read section. Compare these with what Anne writes in her diary. What language was the diary originally written in? In what way is Anne's diary different? Number three, why does Anne need to give a brief sketch about her family? Does she treat Kitty as an insider or an outsider? Number four, how does Anne feel about her father, her grandmother, Mrs. Cooperus, and Mr. Keesing? What do these tell you about her? Number five, what does Anne write in her first essay? Number six, Anne says teachers are most unpredictable. Is Mr. Keesing unpredictable? How? Number seven. What do these statements tell you about Anne Frank as a person? Number one. 
we don't seem to be able to get any closer. And that's the problem. Maybe it's my fault that we don't confide in each other. Number two, I don't want to jot down the facts in this diary the way most people would. But I want the diary to be my friend. Number three, Margot went to Holland in December and I followed in February when I was plunked down on the table as a birthday present for Margot. Number four, if you ask me, there are so many dummies that about a quarter of the class should be kept back. But teachers are the most unpredictable creatures on earth. Page number 55 Number 5 Anyone could ramble on and leave big spaces between the words. But the trick was to come up with convincing arguments to prove the necessity of talking. Thinking about language Number 1 Look at these words. Headmistress Notebook, long-awaited, stiff-backed, homework, outbursts. These words are compound words. They are made up of two or more words. Compound words can be, point number one, nouns, like headmistress, homework, notebook, outbursts. Point number two, adjectives, like long-awaited, Stiff-backed. There may be verbs as well, like sleepwalk, babysit. Match the compound words under A with their meanings under B. Use each in a sentence. Under the column A, number 1 is heartbreaking, number 2, homesick, number 3, blockhead, number 4, law-abiding, number 5, overdue, Number 6. Daydream Number 7. Breakdown Number 8. Output And the expressions given under B to be matched with those in A are Obeying and respecting the law Think about pleasant things Forgetting about the present Something produced by a person, machine or organization Producing great sadness. An occasion when vehicles, machines stop working. An informal word which means a very stupid person. Missing home and family very much. Do something to an excessive degree. Number two. Phrasal verbs. A phrasal verb is a verb followed by a preposition or an adverb. Its meaning is often different from the meanings of its parts. Compare the meanings of the verbs get on and run away in A and B given hereafter. You can easily guess their meanings in A, but in B they have special meanings. A. Point 1. She got on at Agra when the bus stopped for breakfast. Point two, Devanand ran away from home when he was a teenager. Now B, point one, she's eager to get on in life. That means succeed. The visitors ran away with the match. That means won easily. Page 56. Some phrasal verbs have three parts, a verb followed by an adverb and a preposition. C. Our car ran out of petrol just outside the city limits. D. The government wants to reach out to the people with this new campaign. Number 1. The text you have just read has a number of phrasal verbs commonly used in English. Look up the following in a dictionary for their meanings, under the entry for the italicized word. Number one. Plunge. Right in. Here plunge is in italics. Number two. Kept back. Here kept is italicized. Number three. 
ramble on ramble in italics number 4 get along with get is in italics number 2 now find the sentences in the lesson that have the phrasal verbs given hereafter match them with their meanings you have already found out the meanings of some of them are their meanings the same as that of their parts note that two parts of a phrasal verb may occur separated in the text on the left hand side there are certain phrasal verbs and you have to match the expressions given on the right side with the corresponding ones number 1 plunge in number 2 kept back number 3 move up number 4 ramble on number 5 get along with number 6 calm down number 7 stay in number 8 make up for number 9 hand in and now the expressions to be matched number 1 speak or write without focus number 2 stay indoors number 3 make them remain quiet number 4 have a good relationship with number 5 give an assignment or homework to a person in authority that is the teacher number 6 compensate number 7 go straight to the topic number 8 go to the next grade number 9 not promoted number 3 idioms idioms are groups of words with a fixed order and a particular meaning different from the meanings of each of their words put together phrasal verbs can also be idioms they are said to be idiomatic when their meaning is unpredictable for example do you know what it means to meet one's match in english it means to meet someone who is as good as oneself or even better in some skill or quality do you know what it means to let the cat out of the bag can you guess number 1 here are a few sentences from the text which have idiomatic expressions can you say what each means you might want to consult a dictionary first number 1 our entire class is quaking in its boots there is a space for your answer number 2 until then we keep telling each other not to lose heart space for your answer page number 57 3 mr keezing was annoyed with me for ages because i talked so much there is a space for your answer number 4 mr keezing was trying to play a joke on me with this ridiculous subject but i would make sure the joke was on him now there is a space for your answer number 2 here are a few more idiomatic expressions that occur in the text try to use them in sentences of your own number 1 caught my eye number 2 he had had enough number 3 laugh ourselves silly 4 can't bring myself to number 4 do you know how to use a dictionary to find out the meanings of idiomatic expressions take for example the expression caught my eye in the story where under which word would you look for it in the dictionary look for it under the first word but if the first word is a grammatical word like a the for etc then take the next word that is look for the first meaningful word in the expression in our example it is the word caught but you won't find caught in the dictionary because it is the past tense of catch you will find caught listed under catch so you must look under catch for the expression caught my eye 
Which other expressions with catch are listed in your dictionary? Note that a dictionary entry usually first gives the meanings of the word itself and then gives a list of idiomatic expressions using that word. For example, study this partial entry for the noun I from the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary 2005. Now I. The point one is that it's a noun. Number two, it's a part of body. One, C either of the two organs on the face that you see with. The suspect has dark hair and green eyes. Point number two, ability to see. Three, it's singular, the ability to see. A surgeon needs a good eye and a steady hand. Next point, way of seeing. That is number four, C usually singular, a particular way of seeing something. He looked at the design with the eye of an engineer. Next point, of needle, the fifth, C. The hole in the end of a needle that you put the thread through. IDM, be all eyes, to be watching somebody, something carefully, and with a lot of interest before, in front of, somebody's very eyes, in somebody's presence, in front of somebody. He had seen his life's work destroyed before his very eyes. Be up to your eyes in something, that means to have a lot of something to deal with. We are up to our eyes in work. Page number 58. You have read the expression not to lose heart in this text. Now find out the meanings of the following expressions using the word heart. Use each of them in a sentence of your own. Number one, break somebody's heart. Number two, close, dear to heart. Number three, from the bottom of your heart. Number four, have a heart. Number five, have a heart of stone. Number six, your heart goes out to somebody. Number five, contracted forms. When we speak, we use contracted forms. When we speak, we use contracted forms or short forms such as these. Can't for can not or cannot. I'd for I would or I had. She's for she is. Notice that contracted forms are also written with an apostrophe to show a shortening of the spelling of not, would or is as in the above example. Writing a diary is like speaking to oneself. Plays and of novels also have speech in written form. So we usually come across contracted forms in diaries, plays and novels. Number one, make a list of the contracted forms in the text. Rewrite them as full forms of two words. For example, I've, that means I have. Number two, we have seen that some contracted forms can stand for two different full forms. Like, I'd means I had or it may also mean I would. Find in the text the contracted forms that stand for two different full forms and say what these are. Speaking here is an extract adapted from a one-act play. In this extract, angry neighbors who think Joe, the inventor's new spinning machine, will make them lose their jobs, come to destroy Joe's model of the machine. You have just seen how contracted forms can make a written text sound like actual speech. Try to make this extract sound more like a real conversation by changing some of the verbs back into contracted forms. 
then speak out the lines. The door is flung open and several men tramp in. They carry sticks and one of them, Hob, has a hammer. Mob Now where is your husband, mistress? Mary In his bed. He is sick and weary. You would not harm him. Page number 59 Hob We are going to smash his evil work to pieces. Where is the machine? Second man On the table yonder. Hob Then here is the end of it. Hob smashes the model. Mary screams. Hop, and now for your husband, Mary. Neighbors, he is a sick man and almost a cripple. You would not hurt him. Hob, he is planning to take away our daily bread. We will show him what we think of him and his ways. Mary, you have broken his machine. You have done enough. Writing. Now you know what a diary is and how to keep one. Can you keep a diary for a week recording the events that occur? You may share your diary with your class if you wish to. Use the following hints to write your diary. Number one. Though your diary is very private, write as if you are writing for someone else. Point number two. Present your thoughts in a convincing manner. Number three, use words that convey your feelings and words that paint pictures for the reader. Be brief. Diary language has some typical features such as subjectless sentences. Got up late in the morning. Sentence fragments without subjects or verbs. Too bad, boring not good. Contracted forms, there, I have, can't, didn't, etc. And everyday expressions which people use in speech. Remember not to use such language in more formal kinds of writing. Listening. Listening. Your teacher will read out an extract from the diary of Samuel Pepys, given on the next page, about the Great Fire of London. As you listen, complete this summary of the happenings. Summary. This entry in the diary has been made on blank space by blank space. The person who told Pepys about the fire was called blank space. She called at blank space in the morning. Pepys went back to sleep because blank space. Pepys rose again at blank space in the morning. By then, about blank space, houses had been burned down. The fire had spread to blank space by London Bridge. Pepys then walked to the blank space along with Sir J. Robinson's blank space. Page number 60. In this lesson, what we have done. Number one, diary writing is one of the best ways to practice writing. Students do not have to think up or imagine what to write about. They only have to find words to write about what has happened. Initiate your students into the habit of keeping a diary. Number two, Anne Frank's diary became a public document after World War II. Discuss with your students diaries which became historical documents such as Samuel Pepys' diary. You may draw students' attention to different types of diaries, for example, private diary, general diary. Army officers, businessmen, doctors, executives, lawyers, motorists, police officers keep a general diary to record events that happened during the day and events that are scheduled for the day, such as appointments, meetings, things to be done, etc. Number three, passage for listening exercise. 
The Great Fire of London, 1666, September the second, Lord's Day. Jane called us up about three in the morning to tell us of a great fire they saw in the city. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to her window, and thought it to be on the back side of Mark Lane at the farthest. But being unused to such fire as followed, I thought it for enough off, and so went to bed again and to sleep. About seven, rose again to dress myself, and then looked out of the window and saw the fire not so much as it was, and further off. By and by, Jane comes and tells me that she hears that about three hundred houses have been burned down tonight. By the fire we saw, and that it is now burning down all Fish Street by London Bridge. So I made myself ready presently, and walked to the tower, and there got up upon one of the high places. Sir J. Robinson's little son going up with me, and there I did see the houses at that end of the bridge, all on fire. And an infinite great fire on this and the other side of the bridge. From the diary of Samuel Pepys. What you can do, after they have completed the lesson, including the writing exercise, students can be asked to make a diary, jotting for the previous day. Perhaps you could also write a diary entry, describing what happened in school class on the previous day, to share with the class. Try and make it amusing and interesting. Collect students' pages. They may be allowed to sign their names or make it anonymous, as they wish, and put them up on the class notice board, together with your page for everyone to read. Now the glossary. Listless means with no energy or interest. To confide means to tell personal things privately to a person that one trusts. Plunged down, an informal word, put down in a casual way. Quaking in its boots means shaking with fear and nervousness. Old fogey means an old-fashioned person. A ramble on means talk or write aimlessly for long. Convincing argument means a statement made in such a manner that people believe it. Inherited traits means qualities, physical or mental, that one gets from one's parents. Incorrigible means something that cannot be corrected, usually a bad quality. Ingenuity means originality and inventiveness page number 61 it's a poem titled amanda every child feels that she or he is controlled and instructed not to do one thing or another you too may feel that your freedom is curtailed write down some of the things you want to do but your parents or elders do not allow you to to read the poem aloud form pairs each reading alternate stanzas you are in for a surprise now the poem don't bite your nails amanda don't hunch your shoulders amanda stop that slouching and sit up straight amanda there is a languid emerald sea where the sole inhabitant is me a mermaid drifting blissfully did you finish your homework amanda did you tidy your room amanda i thought i told you clean your shoes amanda i am an orphan roaming the street i patter in soft dust with my hushed bare feet the silence is golden the freedom is sweet don't eat that chocolate amanda remember your acne amanda 
Will you please look at me when I am speaking to you, Amanda? Page number 62 I am Rapunzel. I have not a care. Life in a tower is tranquil and rare. I'll certainly never let down my bright hair. Stop that sulking at once, Amanda. You are always so moody, Amanda. Anyone would think that I nagged at you, Amanda. This is a poem by Robin Clean. Now the glossary. Languid means relaxed. Drifting means moving slowly. Pattern means make patterns. Tranquil means calm. Thinking about the poem. Number one. How old do you think Amanda is? How do you know this? Number two. Who do you think is speaking to her? Number three. Why are stanzas two, four and six given in parenthesis? Number four. Who is the speaker in stanzas two, four and six? Do you think this speaker is listening to the speaker in stanzas one, three, five and seven? Number five. What could Amanda do if she were a mermaid? Number six. Is Amanda an orphan? Why does she say so? Number seven. Do you know the story of Rapunzel? Why does she want to be Rapunzel? Number eight. What does the girl yearn for? What does this poem tell you about Amanda? Number nine. Read the last stanza. Do you think Amanda is sulking and is moody?